Our message today is concerning the mission of the Holy Spirit to the world. The Holy Spirit's mission to the world is clearly set out by the Lord Jesus himself in John's Gospel, chapter 16. And it's, we we'll, can read the passage. And in this passage, Jesus is explaining to his disciples, as, he's, as he had explained before many times, that he was, not, he was going away, he was leaving them, he, he had explained what, how he was leaving them through death and resurrection and why he was leaving them. And here he says here in John's Gospel, chapter 16, and we'll read from verse 7. And this is what he says. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. But I do not, if I do not go away, the helper, that's, who, who, that's the term he gives to the Holy Spirit, the helper, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. May God bless the reading of these verses to us. Let's just ask God's blessing on them. Our gracious God, we've read this portion of your word and we pray that as we look at it and consider it together, the Holy Spirit would help us to open up its meaning for our blessing and our understanding and for the furtherance of the work of the gospel and the glory of Jesus. We ask it in his precious name. Amen. So, the Lord has explained in the 14th, 15th and 16th chapters of John's Gospel many things concerning the Holy Spirit coming to the world. Jesus was coming to the end of his ministry here. Before him was the cross before him was the great work of redemption to accomplish the salvation of those who would believe in him. And he was explaining to the disciples, his disciples, the few that had gathered round him, that when he went away, he was going to send someone else to take his place. Otherwise, other, elsewhere he tells us, that the Father was going to send someone else, the same person, the person that's described in this passage of Scripture as the helper. Now, the helper, the, the word translated helper here is, is the translation of the Greek word parakletos. And that simply means someone called alongside a person to help them, as in a court of law, or in a time of trouble. It's actually a legal term. And John translates it in his, uh, or rather it's translated for us in the remarks about it, in, in the use of it in his epistle, when he's speaking about the Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and he describes him as a paracletus. And in that, in that setting, the, the Bible uses the term advocate. So it's a wonderful thing to think that we have an advocate, a helper in heaven, the believers, believers in Jesus, not the world, 
not unbelievers, the believers in Jesus, have a helper, an advocate with the Father in heaven. We've also got a helper, an advocate here, indwelling us, the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what Jesus is promising to his own. Now, we should just think about, we want to speak about the, 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 the Holy Spirit's mission to the world. That's separate from his mission to believers, his mission to the church, his service to the church. Jesus explains all that in these chapters, 14, 15, and 16. And he really, what he does is tells them that everything that Jesus did for his disciples, the few that had gathered around him, and others who had been blessed by his work, What he did for them was going to be done for many, many more in the years, the centuries, the thousands of years to come. And it was going to be done by this, this wonderful person, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we find out there that God <laughs> reveals himself in the first chapter, using this word Elohim. And that's a plural noun. And it, it tells us that, the, the, that God is revealed to us in more than one person. And if we go through the Bible, we discover that God has revealed himself in three persons. One God, three persons. And the first person that's mentioned in the scriptures is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. So God made himself known in many ways, as the writer to Hebrews uh, tells us in his opening remarks, but in these last days, this day of grace in which we are living, a, a, a day that, that has been going on, the, the expression day means a period of time that's now been going on for 2,000 years, and he's revealed himself to us in the person of his son. When Jesus came, he was born in Bethlehem and he lived in total obscurity for the first 30 years of his life. We hardly know anything about it. A child, when he was 10 years old, we're told that he worked as a carpenter, we're told he worked as a carpenter with his father and then probably took over the business when his father died. And then when he was 30 years old, he suddenly appeared in the synagogue in Nazareth. And this is what we read there. It says, He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and sat, stood up to read. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favourable year of the Lord. He closed the book gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Full stop. Now, if you go back to the passage of scripture from which he quoted in Isaiah, you find that he stopped in mid-sentence because he could have gone on and said, and the day of vengeance of our God. But he didn't say that because that was not his mission to the world in his first coming, his first advent. His first coming was a mission of salvation, of blessing, of healing, of making known God's love and saving grace to the world. The prophecy will be completed at his second coming, the day of vengeance of our God. It will be. Many scriptures refer to it in the Old Testament. 
And, of course, in the new, Jesus refers to himself in Matthew's Gospel, and we get John's description of it in the book of Revelation. So that was Jesus' mission statement, you might say, to the world. And it's wonderful because what we find is that all the things that Jesus did, he was a helper, one who stood with the disciples in all the circumstances of his, of his ministry here, in his three years of ministry. He was their teacher. Even unbelievers, even his opponents, described him as teacher. He was their guide. He guided them into the truth that he revealed to them. He spoke of his father. He spoke of the father. He revealed the father to them. He, 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 um, he protected them. When it came to the end, you remember how he said to those who were coming to seize him, let these go their way. Everything that Jesus did. But remember this, when Jesus was here, he spoke to relatively few. Yes, he had audience of thousands. He had an audience of thousands on many occasions. But how many received his word? And this little company that he was speaking to in John was very small. And then he referred in John's Gospel, chapter 4, to this matter of worship. And he revealed it to a Samaritan woman. And, and he, to, he told this Samaritan woman that the Father, God the Father, was seeking worshippers. What kind of worshippers was he seeking? Those who would worship in spirit and truth. And the word spirit there has a capital letter. It refers to the spirit of God. So these things were revealed. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul, wonderful chapter. He tells us about the wonderful work of the spirit of God. One of the things he tells us that the Spirit of God bears witness to our exalted status. Those who believe in Jesus, our exalted status as being having been brought into God's family. We're, we're named as, as sons and daughters of God. And it, he, the Apostle Paul explains it's only people with the Holy Spirit of God who have the power and the ability to please God. And it tells us that the Spirit of God intercedes for us in our infirmity. And there is a wonderful scripture in uh, Romans 8. You can look it up for yourself. It speaks of the moment of resurrection when the dead in Christ will rise. And how is God going to achieve that? He's going to do it by the power of his Spirit. So in that great moment of rapture, when the saints of earth are raised and, cha and, 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 and changed and the, the, those who are still alive on the earth at the time will be changed and given bodies of glory, it's all done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wonderful thing to think that these, this event lies ahead and the Spirit of God is instrumental in it. When Jesus descends from heaven with a shout, accompanied by the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, wonderful thing, all three persons of the Godhead involved in that great momentous event, the rapture, the translation of the church from this world into heaven. Well, that was the spirit, the Lord's mission to the world. But here he, in John chapter 16, the Lord Jesus explains to us and gives us an, a, a, a very, very exact description of the mission of the Holy Spirit to the world. And we read it. I just want to say a few words 
about it. John, John's Gospel, chapter 16. And we can look at it again. It says here, when he comes, the Spirit of God, when he comes, now the Lord's looking forward to his coming. We know that he has come. He came at that day of Pentecost and he descended upon the church that was being formed that very day. That was the formation of the church, God of Christ's church. The church that he was going to build. He says, on this rock I will build. The, the, the truth of his own deity, his own lordship. You're going to build it on that truth. And, and it, was, it came into being at Pentecost. And the Spirit of God descended upon them in tongues of fire. When he descended on the Lord Jesus, he descended as a dove. There was nothing in Christ which he had to deal with. The Spirit of God coming down on these believers there came on them because they were not like Jesus in the sense that they were sinless. They were not sinless. And the, the Spirit of God descended as tongues of fire. And, and dear friends, what we need to know is this, when we believe in Jesus, Christian friends, when we believe in Jesus, we are sealed with the Spirit of God. That takes place the moment a person puts their trust in Christ. God puts a seal on that person and a seal placed on a person by God cannot be broken. Never. Can't be broken. No Outside force can break it. The person themselves can't break it. They might depart from the truth, but they're sealed and they'll be saved. Scripture says, as through the fire. So, this is the Spirit's mission to the world. And first of all, it says concerning sin. And Jesus is very clear and concise and what he means by that, he says this, because they do not believe in me. What is the sin of the world? Rejection of Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the love of God expressed in a way beyond human understanding. The love of God, and it was rejected. And the proof of its rejection is the cross. And Jesus went to the cross, rejected by the world. Above his head, written these words, in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Words of mockery, words of rejection, words showing the stupidity and the wickedness of the heart of man in rejecting the gift of God. The gift of God. That's the sin of the world. They do not believe. Come to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the great white throne, books are opened, detailing the works of men and women. And another book is opened. And that book is called The Lamb's Book of Life. And that is God's standard of whether a person passes the test of his righteousness. Is her name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? When your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it proves that you believed in Jesus. God's own writing. God's book. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? 
it it, that would prove that you believe in Jesus. How do you get your name in the Bar Lamb's Book of Life? By believing in Jesus. Now, and our scripture tells us people's names written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. Let me explain that. That just means that God in his omniscience knew before he even created the world who would accept Jesus as their saviour, who would repent and believe in Jesus. So here's the question. Here's the, here's, here's, here's the truth from the lips of Jesus himself. Sin, because they do not believe in me. How sad. How sad. Particularly a man or a woman facing eternity. Refuse to believe in Jesus. Refuse to believe in Jesus. How sad that is. Then he goes on, of righteousness. Concerning righteousness. Because I go to the Father. And you no longer see me. Jesus was rejected here. And he left the world. He died. He was buried. He shed his precious blood on the cross. In death. And that was what God required as a payment for sin. Christ's death on the cross was a substitutionary death. He died in the place of the sinner. That death, that that substitutionary sacrifice is available to all without exception. But one scripture tells us that he bore the sins, not of all, but of many. He died for all. He bore the sins of many. He bore the sins of of those who in repentance before God came to trust in his person, in his work. And that's what the Spirit of God witnesses to, to the world today. His mission to the world is to bring before them the glory, the greatness of Christ. To point them to Christ. To explain to them there's a saviour available for them. And it's, it's it's the greatest sin in God's eyes to reject Christ. And then righteousness, righteousness. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. Jesus left the world. He ascended into heaven. He went to be be with the Father. He returned to, to the glory of heaven. To sit on the right hand of the Father. On the Father's throne. Not on his own throne. On the Father's throne. He's going to have a throne. He's going to reign. He's not taken up publicly the title of king. Not yet. Each believer recognises Jesus as the one who has absolute authority over their life. There's no argument or doubt about that. But Jesus is at the moment in heaven. And it's a risen, ascended Christ that the believer finds their righteousness established in. My righteousness is in Jesus. The the righteousness of every believer is in Jesus, not in their own works, not in their own life. Not in their own attempts to be pleasing to God. It doesn't work. It can't work. If I assume that by my efforts to please God, he'll accept it. Do you know what that is? That's an insult. An insult. 
to the God who provided me with a saviour. That undermines the work of Christ. Nothing that a man or a woman can do to please God is of any value in his sight regarding this great principle of righteousness. The righteousness of, righteousness of God is found in Christ and it's, it's, it's discovered by needy sinners, by faith, and that faith is the gift of God. In the risen, glorified Christ, God demonstrates, demonstrates to the whole of creation his righteousness, the righteousness of God is demonstrated in the fact that Jesus is seated in glory at his, at the Father's right hand. And then he says, concerning sin, uh, concerning judgment, beg your pardon, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is, has been judged, or it might be, is already judged. God passed judgment on sin at the cross, and Jesus stood in the breach, and Jesus accepted God's judgment upon sin, upon your sin, upon my sin, upon the sin of the world. And the cross. And in his death, his substitutionary death, his substitutionary su sufferings, Jesus took, he bore, scripture says, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Someone put it like this. All alone. All alone. What does it say? Man's, man's weakness, Satan's power, and God's just vengeance. All alone. And without one ray of hope, even from God his Father, Jesus bowed and accepted the wrath of God. He was made sin. Scripture says he was made sin. God's wrath descended on Jesus. And now it says here, concerning judgment. That was one judgment. God's judgment at the cross that involved the death and sufferings of his own beloved son. But judgment is coming. Judgment is coming on this world. And importantly, judgment is coming on the author of sin, the father of lies. And judgment has already been, this world has already been judged. If you go back to the book of Genesis, Book of Genesis. We, we went to the book of Genesis already, and if we go back to the book of Genesis, God speaks directly to Satan, the author of sin, the father of lies. And this is what he says, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. And you shall bruise him on the heel. He, sorry. He shall bruise you or crush you. More, more correctly, he will crush your head. And you will bruise his heel. God passed judgment on Satan. 
at the very beginning of time. And God demonstrated at the cross how that judgment was going to be affected because someone had made themselves available, Jesus, to bear God's judgment, righteous judgment on sin. But God's judgment on Satan stands. And when we go forward to the book of Revelation and chapter 20 and verse 10, we we'll read these solemn words. The devil, the deceiver, was thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented forever. So sentence of that judgment will be carried out and, sentence and ju- the sentence of judgment will be carried out on every believer. That's a solemn fact. That's a solemn fact. I'm not going to go into details of that judgment. But there is a heaven. And there is a hell. And Jesus speaks much more of hell than heaven. That's a solemn fact. Friend, friends, the Holy Spirit of God has been serving this, serving ceaselessly, untiringly, for 2,000 years. Service to the church, service to all believers, service to the world, a mission to the world, convicting of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. What a powerful service it is. What a powerful, glorious person the Holy Spirit is. He's not, he's not recognised in the world. He's only known and recognised by, by believers in Jesus. But his service goes on. And there's one other thing he's doing at the moment, and that is that he is restraining evil. He's restraining evil. And scripture tells us in the second um, Thessalonians, book of the epistle, the second epistle to Thessalonians. There's, there's what's ahead. Now, we spoke already about the translation of believers, the rapture of the church. When that happens, the Holy Spirit's mission to the world ceases, comes to an end. His mission to believers in the world comes to an end, to be taken out of the world. But also his mission to the world comes to an end. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians tells us this, He says this, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now, if it was already at work in Apostle Paul's day, how much more today we see the mystery of lawlessness? 10,000 times greater in this world today. The power of great Dominions that have grown up in this world, all against God, all inspired and promoted by Satan in different ways, working against one another, but all under the control of Satan. He's the ruler of the world. He's the ruler. Some Christians don't like to think that, but Jesus gives them that title, the ruler of the world. And this is what he says. This is what the Apostle Paul says. Mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And then he says this, only he who now restrains will do so 
until he is taken out of the way. Who is the one who restrains? The Holy Spirit of God is restraining evil in this world at the present time, has been doing so for 2,000 years. Before the flood, God said this, My spirit will not always strive with men. Think of the thousands of years that have passed since God said that. Think of the patience of God going on with sinners, affording, witnessing. God has never left himself without a witness in every generation of mankind from the beginning of the world. And he's still doing it today, faithfully, patiently. And the Holy Spirit of God is faithfully and patiently and untiringly witnessing to the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. But the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, writes these words. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken away. Then, then, and not until then, the lawless one will be revealed. That's the one that the scripture speaks of as the Antichrist. Someone who will appear after the church is gone and promote himself as a false messiah. And he'll do it successfully and deceive the world. And evil will be unrestrained. Prophet Amos tells us for that time. He says, there'll be a time come when there'll be a famine, not of bread, but of the word of God. The word of God will, will cease. And the Antichrist, for a short time, will show his power as the ruler of the world. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Jesus stopped when he said, the acceptable year of the Lord. He stopped. Because that, he's, that prophecy referred to his first advent. And then he then we read in Isaiah, the day of vengeance of our God. And when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, as the Apostle Paul prophesies and predicts, and Jesus returns, Jesus returns to this world as a glorious, all-conquering king to deal with evil in all its aspects, the day of vengeance of God will have been set in motion. Friends, to those who have believed in Jesus, is this not wonderful? That God is in control. God is in control. God's over all and above all. There is no other. I am the Lord and there is none. There is no other, he says. And dear friend, if you're listening or watching this video, consider well, the Spirit of God is working and perhaps working in your heart to convict you of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Listen to the Word of God. Listen to the Word of God. Amen.